a hand of praise for this morning. Amen. For his goodness. Amen. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in that song. We will be singing that again. Uh, that is a strong song, straight from the heart of God, straight from Scripture. As William mentioned, that is what we want to do is exalt the text. It's good enough to stand on his own two feet. Amen. Ooh, that was weak. Amen. All right, now, I'm going to get you this morning now because I'm fired up. I've been in the Word, and and I'm ready to let this thing roll. So, uh, yeah, let's go. Let's go, baby. Um, Very thankful for this morning for the gathering. My name is Nolan, by the way. Uh, For those of you that might be new, I'm the lead pastor at this wonderful, beautiful church, and it is a great blessing to see y'all's faces on the weekends and uh, and throughout the week. and And welcome to Life Church. Those that are watching, wherever you are. God bless you, um, and thankful for the gathering this morning. I do want to mention one quick shout-out of thanks to um, Dickie and Nancy Brubaker. They painted the lobby for us. They don't want this praise, but I'm going to give it to them anyway. Thank you all for that. Um, A a labor of love, because it ain't my thing. I'm just telling you. Uh, You give me a paintbrush, and it's going to be a mess. You'll think that Nash did it, my five-year-old, six-year-old. But thank you all for doing that. Such a blessing, and... um, Appreciate y'all. Yep. So it's uh, it's a little bit cold. You know, I thought about doing a baptism this morning. Anybody want to get baptized this morning? <laughs> Here's the thing, though. If you get baptized when it's like less than 15 degrees, you automatically go to heaven in the baptism. Okay? <laughs> so I'm not kidding. You probably will. Um, but, uh, yeah. So it's, it's cold, but the Spirit of God is in here, and that does warm us up. So let me pray. The word is, is ripe and ready. So, God, thank you um, for this morning. God, thank you for the chance to come together. Father, as a local church, there are many brothers and sisters across the world right now who are doing this, but they're gathering in basements and places of seclusion under the threat of their lives. But they're not afraid. They're not scared of death because you're with them and you are in them. But this morning... We come not under the threat of persecution, not under the threat of our lives. We come freely this morning into this place. So, God, may we be thankful and gracious towards you and your kindness towards us. Lord, you woke us up. That is an act of your kindness. And so this morning, Father, will you speak to us, speak through me, your vessel. God, I'm listening. I pray that your people are listening, Lord Jesus. Allow there to be a spirit of receptivity this morning with the word, the seed that will be planted. May it hit that good ground and come up and produce much fruit to the glorification of your name and your name alone. And it is through the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. 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 So for some of you that are here this morning, making the decision to come here is not a difficult decision to make. Uh, The gathering on Sunday mornings is a part of your life, your routine of what you do. There's no question marks of if you're coming on a Sunday to gather and worship. You're doing it. There's others of us that maybe God sovereignly throughout the week put us in some scenarios that turned our thoughts towards, you know what, maybe I need to be in church this weekend. Maybe I need to hear a a word of encouragement this weekend because I'm going through this or through that. And That might be the situation. You might even be in a situation where you know somebody that's a part of this church. They invited you to come, and you showed up. You might be in the scenario of around 48% of people who go, you know what? I don't know where to go, so let me Google churches in Athens. And Life Church of Athens popped up as the seventh one on the feed. You went into the website. You searched it. You saw that there's a pecan-tan preacher and you decided to come to Life Church of Athens to hear an encouraging word. And what you're going to hear this morning is that pecan tan preacher tell you to take your Bibles and go to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, because the topic for this morning is death. Womp, womp, womp. That is our topic for the morning. It is death. But for those of you who know the scriptures and have possibly read ahead, you know that death doesn't get the last say. And the encouragement you were hoping for today, you're going to find it. Because there is a God who brought death to death by death. 
So Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 to 15. We're also going to hit 1 Corinthians 15 at the end. But let me catch you up with where we are as a church. So we're going through the book of Hebrews together in a series titled, Jesus is Greater. Jesus is Greater. And the author of the book of Hebrews is unknown, but we do know that the Holy Spirit inspired it. But in that book, it's laying this multifaceted case for the supremacy of Christ. And the author first established who Jesus is in chapter 1. So who is Jesus according to chapter 1? He is the heir of all things. He is the creator of the world. He is the radiance of God's glory. He is the exact imprint of God's nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. He is the purification for our sin. And he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. It's chapter 1. Chapter 2, we see that he is the founder or the captain of our salvation. He alone, Christ alone, is responsible for rescuing us from the wages of sin and bringing us from death to life. But my question in this, and knowing who Jesus is and what he's done for us, my question is, is why? Why would he choose to do that? Why would he do that for a jacked up person like myself? Why would he do that? Well, I wasn't the only one to propose this question because David proposed the question as well. And he did that in Psalm 8. He said, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. What is man that you're mindful of him? Why do we deserve to be crowned with glory and with honor from a righteous and holy God? Well, to be honest is you don't deserve. You don't deserve to be crowned with glory and honor from this righteous God. We don't deserve it. But when a a lesser created thing is glorified by the greater creator of that thing, does that speak to the glory of the created thing or the glory of the creator of that thing? It speaks to the glory of God. So for God to crown us with glory and crown us with honor is really to crown himself with glory and honor. That's really what we're talking about. Which is why Hebrew 2.10 says this, For it was fitting, we looked at this last week, that God, for whom and by all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation, who's Jesus, perfect through suffering. So my next question is, why suffering? Why does he have to be perfected through suffering? And the reason that Jesus does that is because there is one enemy left to be defeated. In Psalms 8, it told us that creation was also put in subjection to us as creation, that these things are put in subjection to us, the things that we see, birds, animals, creatures, we can tame those things. But there is one outcome of sin that brought something into play and man through his disobedience in the garden in Genesis brings about this situation and in this situation man caused it but he couldn't eradicate it and that situation is death our sin brought this into play and we caused it but we couldn't fix it So since that is the case, if we simply stop there and realize the fact that we messed this thing up, there's no hope inside of ourselves, then all we're left with is just this image of of lostness, this image of darkness, of bewilderment, of being lost like a ship at sea without a sail. But in steps Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9 that says, But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, here it is, crowned with glory and honor. Because of suffering of death. Suffering brought about the crowning of glory and honor. The suffering of death. So that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Taste death for everyone. I remember growing up as a kid, and we would go to my my mom's side of the family's house, and they had a rule. Now, at Thanksgiving, like as a kid, I didn't care nothing about the food. I just want to go play, right? 
But they had a rule. If you're going to go and play, that's cruel and unusual punishment, y'all. If you're going to go and play, you got to clean your plate, right? So you got to clean your plate up. And, and I would be okay with that. I could clean my plate to an extent. But there was something that resembled death on my plate. And I could not eat it. And it was cranberry sauce. <laughs> Disgusting. Still hate it. Cranberry sauce. And I would eat everything else on my plate, but I could not deal with this death on my plate. I wasn't going to touch it. And so I'm sitting there, and my other cousins had endured the, the, the torture of eating it, and they eat their plate, and they're gone, but I'm still sitting there, and I'm, I don't want to eat this stuff. And I'm sad, but I can't go because my aunties wouldn't let me go. And my dad comes up, and he sees this look of sorrow on my face. And he knows what I'm challenged with in front of me, this cranberry sauce. And he says, give me that plate, boy. And he tastes death for me. <laughs> he tastes death for me. And then I get to go out and I get to go play. Listen, death was to be your portion. Death was to be your four-course meal, morning, noon, and night for all of eternity. But God, he licked the plate clean. So now there's nothing left for you to taste. God dealt with that death. He tasted it for you. And in chapter 2, verse 14, we see one of the headings that we have here is devotion to death on behalf of the dead. Let's read it. Verse 14 it says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same thing. That's simply saying this, that that a part of the game plan of redemption was that Jesus would become flesh and blood. Jesus would become human, just like us. This is a, a part of the reason why we partake in this fellowship with Christ is because he, he became one of us. He became just like us. He became flesh and blood. How do we know that? The Bible confirms it in, in John 1, 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we were the walking dead. And if you're not in Christ this morning, you're still the walking dead. But we were the walking dead, aimlessly wandering around. But Romans 5, 8 tells us, But God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still Sinners, while we were wandering around as the walking dead, Christ died for us. Now, there's two things that I want you to see from this verse on a very, very practical level in verse 14. Very practical. There's so many things to be gleaned from this. I'm just giving you two small nuggets. Go home, study it. You'll find more nuggets to fall. But these are just two that I, I practically want to give you. For one, when you look at verse 14, let me just read it one more time. It says, since therefore the children share in the flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. The first thing I want you to see is that God loves you. Like, simply stated, God loves you. To send his son and die on behalf of the dead is something that believers should never get over. You should never get over that. You should never get over your salvation. What it took for you to be a recipient of redemption. You should never get over that. That should never become boring to you. That should never just be an afterthought to you. You should keep that rolling in your mind every single day. The fact that Christ died for you. Exemplified his love. He did it on your behalf. Meaning that we deserved the death that was coming to us. But God, he intervenes and he took your death and he gave you life in exchange. That's love. It's the first practical thing I just want you to see. Secondly, is that he was perfected in suffering. Listen, you don't serve a God who is oblivious to the hurt and pain that you face. I think we can lose sight of this so often because we are in the situations we're in, right? We deal with the struggle that we deal with. But listen, if, if, if you think that you're suffering, you, you haven't come close to the suffering that Jesus experienced. But we often wrestle with God in our pain. We often wrestle 
with God wondering if he hears. We wonder if he cares. We wonder if he's going to do anything about it. And here's my answer to you. He's already done something about it. He's already done something about it. He, he died. But not only did he die, but he rose again on the third day, and he, he sits as your compassionate Savior. And he makes a promise to us in Revelation 21, 4, that he will wipe every tear from your eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. This is the word of God, and it is true. In the midst of your suffering, in the midst of your pain, your questioning, your wondering, you serve a compassionate Savior. And he ex has experienced suffering and death and, and separation and betrayal and all of those things. Yet he stands as a priest who Hebrews chapter 4 will explain to us later that he has the abilities to sympathize with us in our weakness. That's the God that we serve. Next, we see destruction of death by way of death. Verse 14, the second part of it, says that through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. See, God knew that the only way to redeem the dead was to utilize death itself. Utilize death itself. The reason for the, the incarnation, right? We just came out of the Christmas season, this sweet little baby Jesus, right? The reason for the incarnation of the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us was to die. That was the reason. That was the purpose for it. it it's not as if, you know, Jesus came to, to, to earth to try to evade and escape death so that at some point Hollywood can make a movie with Charlton Heston in it as Jesus with a big beard and he's riding off into the sunset on a donkey, right? That's not the, the ending story of, of Jesus. And, and when we watch movies like The Passion of the Christ, we're like, y'all, don't kill him. Jesus, fight back. But if he doesn't die, you don't get salvation. If he doesn't die, you don't get redemption. If he doesn't die, you don't live. So he has to die. It is a part of the game plan. It is a part of the purpose of his Coming And another purpose of the death of Jesus was that he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. Now let's provide some clarity around this. To destroy here, it doesn't mean to put the devil out of existence. That's not what he's saying here when he uses the, the word destroy. But it means to nullify him. It means that Christ broke the back of his power. It, it means that he took away his capacity to trap you into fear, particularly fear of death. Christ stripped him of his power. How did he do that? I think Colossians 2 is the perfect segue to go into. Colossians 2, 13 through 15. You can write that down. I'll go ahead and read it. It says, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, that was our state, but God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. How does he do it? Verse 14, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside. How did he do it? He did it by nailing it to the cross. So when Christ, he, he died for us, right, that, that record of debt, it, it had stood against us with all of our sins. And all of our sins were recorded in that record. But Christ, he took those and he nailed them to the cross. Now here's the key in verse 15. He disarmed the rulers and authorities, that's Satan. And he put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. See, Jesus, he took away that one weapon that could condemn me. Because aside from Christ, my sin does condemn me. The scriptures talk about the legalities of it. See, we serve a righteous God. We serve a holy and just God, and he goes according to his law. He will not violate his own law. And sin is legally binding. 
but someone else has to come in and pay the penalty and incur the wrath of that sin. And when Jesus did that through his death on the cross, he made an open shame of the devil. And now the record that was once against you has been applied to the blood of Christ. And you stand redeemed and you stand forgiven. And you stand as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's, that's a great place to say amen. Thank you, sister. That was, I mean, you stand as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He took away that weapon, the thing that could condemn us. Now we see in verse 15 of Hebrews 2, deliverance from death. Verse 15, and Jesus, he delivered all those who through fear of death were subjected to lifelong slavery. So he delivers us who through fear of death were subjected to lifelong slavery. I got a question for you this morning. Are you afraid of death today? If you are afraid of death, you need to ask yourself, why am I afraid of death today? See, the fear of death, it rules as a tyrant over humanity. Primarily because people aren't ready to die. They're not ready. If I ask you, you know, are are, are you... Ready to die? Are you ready for death? Maybe you might say something like, you know, yes, I'm ready because I have a really good life insurance policy. I'm ready because my will is in order and I know who's going to get what when I check out of here. Like I've got all that stuff into play. My family's going to be taken care of. And listen, all those things are great and you need to have those things in place. You do. But that's not what I'm talking about. See, what a tragedy it would be to have your earthly affairs in order, but your eternal affairs be left unaccounted for. And to simply believe that there is a God and a heaven and an eternal settling at the end of good versus evil, that's no different than believing that there's a really good life insurance policy that exists, but you never buy it. You never get it. Well, my friends, eternal life in and with Christ is a policy that you will need, but you personally can't afford it. And this is unlike any other policy because you don't, you don't buy it and then forget about it until it's time to cash in on it. And this actually isn't a policy at all. What I'm talking about is a person, and his name is Jesus. Amen. That's who you need. Those who have received the gift of salvation are those who have been freed from the fear of death. That's why you can talk to believers and their conversation around this topic is so much more different than anybody else. Because they've been freed from the fear of death. There's no fear in death. And if you are freed from the fear of death, listen, you are the freest amongst all You are the freest. Doesn't matter the bondage of this life, the struggles that you face, the financial hardships, the health hardships. If you have been freed from the fear of death by the work of Christ, the finished work of Christ, you are the most free out of anybody. You're free. Now, I want want to finish this way with 1 Corinthians 15 because it speaks of that eternal life. And that freedom that we have in Christ. In in verse 54, it says this. It says, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. See, Paul, he quotes the prophet Isaiah when he says this from the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 25. He also quotes Hosea chapter 13. And what's happening here is that God is announcing to death that it will die. See, from the fall of man when God declared, eat this fruit and you will surely die, guess what? Death has been doing its job. Every since then. But there is coming a day when death itself is going to die because there is one factor, there is one 
factor alone. And here's the factor. God decided to get involved. Now God has declared that death is is his enemy. And I'm cool with that because God doesn't lose to anybody. So death is now his enemy. And the language is strong here in the text. He says, death is swallowed up in victory, verse 54. See, that word swallowed up, it means to be, to be eaten up, to be totally consumed. The prophets, they predicted the day when, when death would, in fact, die, and that that stinger, that, that sting of death would be removed. Verse 55, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Did you know that this is literally a taunt? It's a taunt to death. Death is powerless. Dying holds no dread. The grave holds no grief. And verse 56, the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, death would have no sting at all if it wasn't for sin. When some insects bite you, and I'm sure all of you at some point have been bitten by an insect with a stinger, They leave their stinger embedded in your flesh. But when they do that, they're going to soon die. Insects will die after they have left their stinger in you because they've been robbed of their sting. They've been robbed of their ability to naturally defend themselves, and they soon die. And in a very real sense, death, it stung itself to death when it stung Jesus. It emptied all of his venom, all of his poison onto Jesus. And now our liberating king, he gets to taunt death and say, hey, where's your sting at now? Where's it at now? So now for us, see, death is different because to die is to gain because that sting is gone. And we get to be reunited with Christ forever when this life is over. When you stand over an unbeliever, which I've done this before as a, as a pastor having to bury someone, when you stand over the lifeless body of an unbeliever at the end of their life, it's, it's not the same as when you stand over a believer. The sadness of standing above an unbeliever is incurable because you know there is no more hope left for them. There's no more hope beyond the grave. But when you mourn in the presence of a believer who has finished their race and fought well, you mourn, you cry, you hurt, but you do it with hope. You do it with hope. Because you know that because of their union with Christ, they are now more alive in that moment than they've ever been on this earth. Because death was overcome by Christ. As I finish this morning, Another question for you. Are you a slave to fear and death today? See, if you're not prepared to die, I would actually argue that you're not prepared to live. And in Christ, to live, to live is Christ and to die is gain, Philippians 1.22. Now, as I begin this whole discourse about the topic for today, and all this talk about death, I'm, I'm, I'm not suggesting that if you know you're ready to die, to go out here and live recklessly because you're prepared to die. Don't, don't do that. But there is actually a death that you and I have to engage in every single day. And it is a death to ourself. It is a death to our flesh, a death to our will, a death to our way. You do have to continually wake up dying to yourself. And one thing that will help you in the midst of that dying process is to just remember that, listen, it's not your kingdom that we are building. It is the Lord's kingdom. It's not the kingdom of Noah. It's not the kingdom of Life Church. It's God's kingdom. It's, It's his kingdom that we are citizens of. I just, I feel this morning that somebody just needs to be reminded of this undergirding truth of scripture that in the midst of this life and everything that comes with it, if you belong to Christ, he will take care of you. He will take care of you. If 
You're stressing over finances, stressing over health conditions, stressing over headaches and heartaches. Just be reminded this morning that the Lord will take care of you. I mean, after all, if he's willing to come and die for you in your place, don't you think he knows what you're struggling with today? Don't you think he knows the stresses of your heart and mind that weigh upon you? He knows and he does care. We don't have to question that for a moment. He died for us, for you. So absolutely he cares. Dealing with deep grief today, know that the Lord cares for you. How do I know that? Because in his death on the cross, he declared something. He said, it is finished. He said, it is finished. And that qualified him to handle anything that you are facing and ever will face. That qualified him in his resurrection. So simply state it. Trust in him. Lean on him. Because he brought death to death. By way of death. If you don't know Christ this morning, if you've not surrendered to him fully, everything that I've said, it can apply to you, but it doesn't in the moment because you're not surrendered to Jesus. And I want to be very clear today. You must surrender to Christ. You must stop running. You must stop trying to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to handle this. I'm going to muscle on through this. I'm going to figure this out. Question, how well has that worked out so far? Trust in Christ. Just stop. Just quit resisting. You don't have to know all there is in theology and doctrine. And, and, and nobody ever will until they're gone from this life and in the presence of God. You need to know the simplicities of our faith. God does love you, but sin also separates you from him. And you can be saved and redeemed today. And if you are saved and redeemed, live like it. Live like it. Walk in the freedom that you have in Christ. God, thank you for the word this morning. God, thank you once again for the truth that is in these verses. Two verses today, but so rich, so full of grace and truth. Father, wherever we might be today in whatever state we're in, mentally, physically, emotionally, Lord, you're, you're not unaware of those things. Lord, you are calling us and convicting us. So our response this morning is to trust and to obey. Father, you don't leave us to try to figure this thing out on our own or muster up our own strength. You have sent the comforter. The Holy Spirit is here. He is at work in the lives of the believers, and the Holy Spirit is drawing the hearts of men and women to where the redemption is, and it is found in Christ and Christ alone. So God, may today be a day of salvation. They don't have to wonder about their faith or assume faith. They can know that they have faith because you've granted it to us. You've given us the faith to believe. So Father, go with your people this morning, throughout the week that is unknown to us, but it is known to you. So God, we walk by faith and not by sight. We trust you in all things. Help us to continue to lean on you, to trust in you, knowing that you care for us. God, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. If y'all would stand with me, we're going to sing another song of worship. And um, just continue to dial your hearts into the words, the lyrics, the truth that rest in, in these songs of worship. And, and let's thank God for who he is.